All right, hi everyone. Thanks for coming out today. My name is Tiana Darling. I'm here with the New England Air Museum down in Windsor Locks, Connecticut. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about the museum. Has anyone here been to the museum before? Oh, a bunch of you, all right. Well, you'll get a refresher course on the museum and what we have there in case you wanna come back and visit us again. We have some new, new exciting things going on. And then we're gonna jump into some of our warbirds um, that we have, our World War II era aircraft. Um, so we'll jump into that afterwards. But thank you for having me. It's really nice to be here today. So in the New England Air Museum, like I said, we're located in Windsor Locks, Connecticut. We are located right across from Bradley International Airport. So when you step out of our museum, we often watch the aircraft taking off at the runway just right, right across the street from us. We are also right near Bradley Tower, so we actually have that playing all the time. So it's nice to be able to see the real aircraft taking off um, as well as in our museum. We have three large exhibit hangars um, that you can explore that are open to the public. We have a military aviation hangar, a civil aviation hangar, and then our B-29 hangar that represents the 58th bomb wing. We also have a couple of hangars of aircraft that we don't have open to the public, but that we rotate through. So we do have um, two separate storage hangars for our aircraft, as well as a restoration hangar, which is a working shop for our volunteers to restore our aircraft. How do we get to be here? So um, our parent organization is actually the Connecticut Aeronautical Historical Association. And so in 1959, a group of a couple guys got together and they really wanted to buy this airplane that you see on the screen here. This is a 1917 Bancroft airplane that a farmer had found in his garage, in his barn, sorry. Um, so these guys got together and they were like, hey, we really wanna buy this airplane, let's pool our money together. And so they did, they went out, they purchased the Bancroft airplane, uh, brought it back. Unfortunately, the start of a couple of disasters for our museum, um, this aircraft burned in a fire just a few months later in early 1960. But it is the first ever aircraft owned by the New England Air Museum. We actually still have these wheels, the metal part of the wheels did survive the fire, so we do have those on display at the museum. Because it is really the start of our of our 63 year journey. So um, in August 1960, just a few years after, I mean a few months after the fire, they decided, hey, you know what, this is pretty cool, we should stay together, we should do something, we should start collecting aircraft. And they did, they incorporated in August of 1960, so actually yesterday was our 63rd birthday of the Connecticut Aeronautical Historical Association, and we only grew from there. Some of you may remember, if you've been to our museum uh, quite a few years ago, we used to be called the Bradley Air Museum. So in the early 60s, these guys were really focused on collecting aircraft of the region, and they were really focused on Connecticut aircraft. So they started collecting different aircraft. They finally started to open some form of a museum. It was actually these big air shelters. They were kind of think of like a, a big, big circus tent that was blown up. Um, again, those were destroyed in some weather related incidents, but by the early 70s, we were really rolling right along. We had all of these aircraft. So this is Route 75 in Windsor Locks. The airport is right over there. Um, we had a big outdoor display, as you can see, with a lot of different large aircraft. Um, and we also finally got an indoor display. The airport leased uh, Building 170 that they weren't using just down the road from here. And so it was a two-part museum. You'd go from one side, um, the outdoor exhibit, you get a two-part ticket, you go to the other side. So the 70s, we were really rolling along as a Bradley Air Museum. We didn't change the name until the early 80s when we decided that, you know what? We don't wanna focus on just Connecticut, we're gonna focus on um, everybody here. 1979, some of you may remember the tornado that blew through. So um, on August, October 3rd, 1979, a huge F4 category tornado blew up Connecticut and into parts of Massachusetts, as you can see on the map here. Uh, this caused a lot of devastation. Three people were, were killed in this, unfortunately, and many, many homes, businesses were destroyed. We don't, we don't see F4 tornadoes in Connecticut, so, or Massachusetts, or wherever in New England normally. Um, and unfortunately, it did come right through directly the museum 
here's Bradley Field. Museum's right there. And so as you can see, I'm gonna show you some more pictures in a minute, but it devastated the museum. It went directly, was directly in the tornado's path. So this is what the interior of our building looked like. You can see here, it was Bradley Air Museum across the top. Tore the roof off the building um, and a lot of the interior aircraft were, were tossed around a little bit. They fared a little better than our outside aircraft, um, but it was still, still rough. And this is what our outdoor aircraft looked like. So um, you can see this is a Lockheed Constellation flipped on its back. A lot of times people will say that was its last flight because it literally flew in the air, came back down upside down. Um, we have a helicopter rolled into a ball. All of this, this is just part of it. Um, in total, we lost 16 aircraft that were on display. They were deemed not repairable. Um, the rest were either considered fine or salvageable. So a lot of our, some of our aircraft on display you'll see at the museum are what we call tornado survivors. So we'll talk about our B-29 in a little bit. That was one that went through the tornado and had damage, as well as our F-104 Starfighter and a few others. So we actually do have volunteers on staff today who were working during this and remember the tornado. They remember coming to the museum, flashing their badges, you know, trying to get through so they could see what happened to the Air Museum. And it was extensive cleanup. But again, we're fighters at the Air Museum, um, and they decided, you know what, we're not going to throw in the towel. We're going to keep going. And so they reopened um, just a few years later. So we were lucky enough that the, aircraft, the airport leased us, again, some property out on Perimeter Road. It was kind of the swamp lands of Windsor Locks. It was not necessarily the best land, um, but they weren't using it, and we needed some land. So we uh, set up shop over there, and we opened our first hangar in 1981, which you can see here, this is what is now our civil aviation hangar. That's our oldest on-site hangar. Um, this was actually, we were only closed for just a little bit during the tornado. They actually opened a lot of the exhibit so that people could come and view the tornado wreckage for like 10 cents or something. Really, really cheap, just so they could say we had our doors open. Um, and so, but then again, we opened in 1981. We changed the name a couple years later, and we've been growing ever since. Like I said, we next built our military hangar. Our, um, our B-29 hangar was built in the early 2000s. So we have continued to grow more than those four guys who bought the Bancroft airplane could probably ever imagine, which is a lot of fun to see. Like I said, we do have a working restoration hangar. So we have pretty much an all volunteer crew aside from one restoration coordinator on staff. The rest are volunteers. We have dozens of volunteers that come in and work to restore all the aircraft you see on display. So most of our aircraft we get not looking in, in tip top shape. So they have to strip them down to uh, the bare metal, work on the inside. And these projects often take years. Um, we've had projects take over, over um, 20 years to complete, all volunteer hours. So they are really, the, our volunteers are really the heart and soul of our museum. Right now, these are some projects they're working on at the moment. This is actually, so um, that top right corner there is our Command HOK helicopter. Um, it's a marine helicopter uh, built in Connecticut by the command company. And that was the one they just finished recently. So you can see here, they're putting the rotor blades on and now that's on display in our museum. We also have people that work on engines. So I believe this is our Allison engine um, that they're working on here. And those are undergoing restoration in our shop currently. And some of the big projects they're working on right now, we do have an outdoor display yard. And so they are working on what we call preservations of those aircraft. So they've been out on display for a number of years just because we don't have the space to fit all of our aircraft. But the weather is not great for our aircraft outside. So as you can see here, this is our Grumman Tracer. Um, funny looking airplane with the big radar dome on the top. And so that's one they're working on right now. So this is what it looked like. Here's some of our volunteers tugging it out of the yard. 
and this is what it looks like just a few weeks ago. Um, they soda blasted the outside, so you can see all the paint is stripped. Um, and next they are folding the wings, because those are foldable wings, so that it can fit inside our restoration hangar for them to restore. So preservations are being completed on all our outdoor aircraft. Then they'll go back on outdoor display, but they are much better suited. They're not doing full restoration, so a full restoration would be the interior as well. Those are remaining as they are. We also have a lot of one-of-a-kind aircraft that you cannot see anywhere else at the museum. This is one such aircraft. This is the Sikorsky VS-44. So you might know the name Sikorsky. He's known for his helicopters. He was the pioneer, Igor Sikorsky, pioneer of helicopter aviation rotary wing flight. Um, before he got into helicopters, he did a lot with flying boats and amphibian, amphibious aircraft. So this is actually a flying boat. It would never have had the wheels on when it was flying. It would only take off and land from the water. There was only three of these ever built, the X, the X Cambion, which you see here, the Excalibur, and the Exeter, the Flying Aces. And the Exeter and the Excalibur both crashed in the 1940s, so this is the only one remaining on display. This flew priority passengers from New York to Ireland in the 1940s. You had to pay a pretty penny to fly on this, um, and it was a long flight. You'd be on this aircraft for about 17 hours. Um, yeah, quite, quite the flight. Before pressure, they was not pressurized either, so it was a little bit of a bumpy ride. However, the interior, you had beds you could spread out on. It's nothing like we would fly today. They had a full, full meal service. You'd be able to sleep on this aircraft. Um, two, two separate crews that would switch off. You don't really want your pilots flying for uh, 17 hours straight. Um, after that, it changed hands a few times, and it actually ended up in the hands of one Charlie Blair, who was a test pilot for Sikorsky back in the day. He bought it with his wife, famous movie actress Maureen O'Hara. And the two of them owned this aircraft in Florida, where they flew um, in the Florida Keys area. However, it did sustain some damage after Charlie Blair passed away. It sat for a long time, looked really rough. And Maureen O'Hara said, you know what? I'm going to donate it. So she donated it to the Naval Museum in Pensacola, Florida. They were kind of like, what are we going to do with this really rough looking aircraft? So they sent it to us. Um, and we said, great, we'll take it from off your hands. Um, so it was shipped on a barge all the way uh, to Stratford, Connecticut, where this uh, restoration was completed by a lot of Sikorsky volunteers um, who had originally worked on this aircraft back in the 40s. So now we're, we're in the late 80s at this point. And they're, so they're working on this aircraft. They trucked it to the museum. They had to refit its wings inside. It was quite a bear to move this aircraft. We have done it since. It's not easy. Um, and so now it sits on display. And Maureen O'Hara did come in the 90s to be able to see her, her aircraft on display, which is pretty cool. But yeah, one, one of a kind aircraft you really can't see. Um, any other VS-44s. Oops, Oop, too far. Um, we also have a lot of exhibits in our museum. We recently have opened one on New England women in aviation. We have recently opened one on the Kosciuszko Squadron, which was a Polish squadron that flew with the RAF during World War II. And this is our newest um, exhibit. This kind of goes with our Warbirds theme of the day, uh, the Tuskegee Airmen, Their Untold Stories, which follows the African-American fighter group in World War II, um, the famous Tuskegee Airmen and their exploits. The best part about this exhibit is not only the story of the Tuskegee Airmen, but we really focused on the stories of their friends and family and of themselves. So we conducted a lot of interviews um, of friends, siblings, children, uh, grandchildren of these gentlemen to really hear the stories from their perspective. So this opened in June, and we were lucky enough to have four Tuskegee Airmen who are still living in attendance at the opening, a um, couple of which are about to hit, or actually did hit 100 years old since this photo was taken in June, which is pretty cool. All sharp as attack um, and have great stories. The two gentlemen in the blue and red jackets, that is Harry Stewart and James Harvey, they were actually 
um, the first part of the first group of Top Gun winners um, back in the 40s. The Tuskegee Airmen won that competition, although it was not recognized until much later. Um, we do have a Connecticut connection, so this jacket right here was the flight jacket of Lemuel Custis. He was one of the first group of five people to go through um, Tuskegee training. And he was from Hartford, Connecticut. He was actually the first African-American police officer in Hartford. And he was on our board at the Air Museum for a while. So a little connection there. We're very excited about this exhibit um, opening in June. Well, yeah, sure. I would like to mention that the movie Red Tails yes. is probably one of the best representation of the Tuskegee Air Force. Air pilots. Absolutely, yes. If you ever haven't had a chance to see it, check out Red Tails, like you mentioned. It is a very, very good movie, and it is a very good representation of them as well. Thank you. We have a lot of programs at the museum, so um, we have a really large education department that deals with our Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, school groups, Soar for STEM, which is a grant-funded education program. But we've also been working on programs for adults as well so that we can have people of all ages. So we do host Adult Aerospace Academy programs at the museum. Um, this is one from the spring where we did a whole lecture and tour of Pratt & Whitney engines. So um, we had our volunteers who are Pratt retirees uh, come and give us a whole lecture on the history of Pratt as well as this um, engine right here, we're taking a tour in this photo, is the J58, which powered the SR-71 Blackbird. So we have a lot of cool things on display that we like to learn about. Um, we've had all kinds of programs. We do range from blimps of World War II to aircraft accident investigation. So really running, running the whole list of different programs. Uh, we took a break for the summer, but we will be starting up again. This is my my plug for you all, um, we're starting up again in September that those programs will be released in the next couple of weeks. So if you're interested, um, definitely check us out. Come on down, we'd love to have you at the museum. All right, any questions about just a little overview of the museum? Yeah. Where were these, where were these aircrafts obtained from? Great question. All over the place, really. So a lot of ours are donations, people you know, wanting to get rid of their aircraft, the donations. Some of them were purchased. So sometimes the military has surplus aircraft that they were able to purchase. A lot of that was done, a lot of that collecting was done in the early years. Um, and then sometimes we have things on, on loan to us. So for example, that Sikorsky VS-44, technically we don't own that outright. We call it like a permanent loan from the Navy. So they, they put it on loan for us um, and we're able to display it and it's technically not owned by us. So a little bit of every, we get them from a little bit of everywhere. Yeah. Do you have any functioning simulators? Great question, yes we do. Um, so we have a couple of different simulators that are brand new. We have a Redbird flight simulator. So it is a full motion, simulator where you can fly a Cessna 172. It's really the closest thing you can get to flying a real airplane without leaving the ground. Um, so pilots can actually log hours in it. It's pretty cool. Um, and then we also have a couple of new ones where you can fly an F-18 fighter um, and another one that switches out a few times. So yeah, we love our simulators. They're very popular, especially with the kiddos and adults as well. Yeah. First of the slide where they were reconditioning the engine. Mm -hmm. You fly any of these planes that you have? Not you personally. Not, yeah, you would not want me fly. I'm not a pilot. You wouldn't want me flying. But no, that's a great question as well. We do not have any flight-worthy aircraft. We don't keep them up to flight-worthy standards. We we do our engines, and then we keep the engines on display. We say our aircraft are restored to about 90 95%. It's just those last few connections that are never made. We never will fly them again just for our own sake and for insurance purposes. But um, we do have a couple that we say with just a few tweaks, they would be airworthy. We have a Waco um, biplane that was flown into the museum when it was donated to us. So that one probably would be able to fly fairly easily, any of them that came to the museum. But we do not keep our aircraft flight worthy. Um, but we do often sometimes work with a commemorative Air Force and they'll bring in airplanes that are flight worthy and we can, we can have people fly those. 
Any other questions? Awesome, all right, we're gonna jump into Warbirds of World War II. Pardon me, I'm gonna read a little bit off my notes for this one just because I wanna make sure I'm getting you guys all the right information and I'm not missing anything. So we have a lot of Warbirds here at the museum. I'm just gonna touch on a handful today, but um, if you're interested, we have many, many more Warbirds here at the museum. So one of our favorites is the P-47 Thunderbolt. Something I forgot to mention that's kind of cool about our museum is we do let our visitors sit in some of the historic aircraft. Not everything, we can't always get into, you know, it's really hard to get people up into our A-10 or something like that. But the P-47 is one that you can actually come to the museum. If we have volunteers on duty, they will let you sit in this World War II era aircraft. So with an empty weight approaching five tons, the P-47, sometimes nicknamed the Fatty from Farmingdale, was never an important close-up dogfighting champion, but it did excel at dive and zoom attacks against enemy fighters and ground targets. It was powered by the Pratt & Whitney R R280, sorry, <laughs> um, double wasp engine augmented with a General Electric supercharger, turbocharger, the P-47 could operate effectively at high altitudes as a long-range bomber escort as a, or as a low fighter bomber. The exhaust ductwork needed to route the engine um, gas to the turbocharger, as well as the turbocharger, intercooler, and related subsystems were all located behind the pilot. And that resulted in the characteristic jug shape that you'll see here. So it's kind of a large um, aircraft for a fighter. Additionally, the Pratt and & Whitney and Republic Aviation team teamed up to install a water injection system that could boost engine output from 2,000 to 2,500 horsepower for approximately 12 minutes in a war emergency power setting. There we go. Um, and I do have handouts for you guys that I'll pass out after with all the facts that you see on the screen here, so you can take that home with you. Um, Neem's P-47 was declared surplus in 1947 after having been used for training. The aircraft, along with 19 others, were sent to the Peruvian Air Force as part of their defense assistance program. In 1971, Peru sent this particular P-47 to the U.S. Air Force Museum. But since they already had one, it was then loaned to us. We were the Bradley Air Museum at that point. The aircraft underwent restoration by the Connecticut Air National Guard before going on display here. The Thunderbolt at Nîmes is surrounded by an exhibit highlighting and memorializing the 57th Fighter Group in World War II. The plane, which is the centerpiece of the exhibit, is outfitted in the colors and insignia of the 65th Fighter Squadron of the 57th Fighter Group. During the war, the 57th was the first combat unit stationed at Bradley Field, and actually Lieutenant Eugene Bradley, for which the um, airport is named after, was part of the 57th Fighter Group. He unfortunately crashed during a training exercise, and hence they named it Bradley Field after Lieutenant Eugene Bradley, and the name stuck after the war. Um, the 57th was the first American unit to work with the Royal Air Force, serving extensively in North Africa. So Harvey Lippincott, who is one of the founders of the museum, one of those original guys we talked about, um, was the designer of this exhibit and traveled with the 57th during World War II as a Pratt & Whitney engineer. One cool thing about this aircraft, so while restoring the P-47, the restoration staff used a picture of one of the 65th Fighter Squadron's aircraft, which had the name Norma on it, um, with pilot, so they were able to find a picture with this, and it had Lieutenant Bradley Mull next to it. Neem's Thunderbolt was restored to be this plane, and many years later, Mull was found and contacted, and he told the story um, to the museum about his P-47. In 1945, Lieutenant Mull met Nor nurse Norma Holler, right here, while stationed in Italy. He was smitten and named the plane Norma after her, and the two were married the same year and lived happily lives after the war was over. In the late 90s, they were able to come, as you can see here, and visit the museum and see the plane um, that was restored to be Lieutenant Mull's plane, Norma. So normally when we talk about World War II warbirds, we often talk about fighter planes like we just talked about. We're gonna branch out a little bit and talk about some kind of unique, what we can consider warbirds here at the museum. 
One such is our Goodyear ZNPK 28 blimp control car. So on December 11th, 1941, Germany declared war on the United States and German submarines previously patrolling in international waters were authorized to attack military and commercial shipping within American waters, resting on the ocean floor in relatively shallow water during the daytime to avoid detection, undersea boot, which are literally under the sea boats, um, surfaced at night and with the speed provided with their diesel engines enabled them to catch and destroy allied shipping, creating critical supply shortages. During the first six months of World War II, 350 ships were lost to enemy submarine attacks. At the start of World War II, the United States Navy only had four new non-rigid K-series airships um, suitable for combat which were immediately pressed into service against the enemy submarines. Remembering the success of the airships during World War I, the US Navy ordered an additional 131 K-series airships from Goodyear, located in Akron, Ohio. The K-series blimp envelope measured 252 feet across that in length and contained uh, 425,000 cubic feet of helium, providing 26,000 pounds of lift. Suspended beneath the envelope is a 42-foot-long control car that you can see there, carrying elect electronic radar, sonar, magnetic anomaly detection equipment, and operated by 10 Navy personnel. It was powered by two Pratt & Whitney R1340 WASP radial engines. The K-Series blimp had a cruising airspeed of 46 miles per hour, fast enough to accompany and defend the ship's convoys. These were very, very useful during the war. Um, they were able to keep many, many ships safe. So they would fly, I, wish, I should have put a picture of them flying above the ships. So they would fly above these ships and they would be able to see the U-boats. So the U-boats really were on this, they could not stay on the, surf, on the bottom of the ocean for very long because of their engines. They would have to surface um, to the air. So when they would surface, these guys are right above them, and oftentimes those U-boats would see the blimp up ahead and be like, oh no, and would have to dive back under. When they were on the floor of the ocean, they really could not travel very fast, so our ship convoys could outrun them. When they're on the surface, however, that's when they would travel fast, and that's when the issues would happen. So by having these blimps, they were outfitted with um, weapons as well. So by having these blimps above, uh, really put a damper on um, the U-boat attacks on our shipping supply. So after the war, Goodyear purchased um, most of the blimps back and used them for other purposes. So they were stripped of their interior and used as what you would think of as the normal Goodyear blimps. Um, in 1980, the K-28 control car was donated to the museum by Goodyear. And it was one of those that had been stripped completely of its interior, of its World War II standing. Um, you know, it said Goodyear on the side. It was an advertising blimp. They donated it to us. And um, it really sat for a very long time until 1993 when one volunteer said, hey, that blimp we have outside, we got to do something. We, you know, and the director said, all right. Well, we either have to restore it or get rid of it. It's just sitting there, rotting away, causing issues. And he said, you know what, we'll, we'll fix it up. We can do this. So uh, crew chief Russ Magnuson took a look at this, and it was actually a much bigger project than he could have ever imagined. Um, he had to strip the whole interior. The floor was rotting away. He had to... Um, strip all the paint off, and the problem was that it was not fitted to look like a World War II blimp car. And most of the plans had actually been destroyed or were not easily accessible. Um, so he had to work from, oh, they spent a lot of time in the library, on microfilm, looking for plans, and they had to rebuild most of the interior of this aircraft. So for example, the engine cowlings on the side, they, there was nothing that was going to fit exactly, so they had to make wooden engine cowlings and use an en English wheel to form the metal there. Um, they had all kinds of things. We have a lot of these stories at the museum where they had the wrong engines inside and they, we couldn't get the right engines. It wasn't, they weren't ever going to have um, the right engines because these engines are slightly different. So 
instead of a normal gear engine, a normal engine which would spin, you want it to spin fast, these blimps, we needed them to slow down so that they could follow the ships. So there's actually outfitted with special gears to slow those propellers down. Um, we had the wrong engines in. We said, you know, close enough. It, no one's going to know. And some guy actually came to the museum and said, hey, you know you got the wrong engines in your blimp car. And they said, oh, yeah, well, we, we can't get the right engines. And he said, well, I actually have those engines at my place. So if you give me your engines, I'll, I'll give you mine. So we have a lot of stories like that. But this took so long, Russ and his crew, this was actually an over 20 year restoration project for them to be able to restore this back to what you see here. So like I said, this is, I'll go back, this is the bottom part. So this is the control car right here. So normally you would have a big blimp envelope on the top, about the size of our hangar. Um, and 10 person crew, this is a picture of the interior. So they restored the full interior um, com complete with gauges, toilets, we even have eggs in the frying pan, a little fake carrier pigeon, because they would use those to um, communicate with the ships below. Um, and when you look at it, it's really hard to imagine 10 people working and living in this um, while they're on these, these ships. But like I said, over 20 year restoration project, a lot, a lot of hours were put into this. Um, and this is one of our unique aircraft. There is not another restored World War II era blimp car that you can see anywhere. So come check it out if you haven't already. All right, again, with our kind of unique, um, unique warbirds, we don't always think about helicopters in World War II, but they, they were there. So this is the Sikorsky R4 um, S47 hoverfly helicopter. So um, also known as the VS-316, it was developed by the famous, uh, it was developed from the famous Sikorsky VS-300 helicopter, which was really the first functioning helicopter that Sikorsky had put together. Um, and it was first publicly flown without a tether in May 1940. So Igor Sikorsky and Sikorsky aircraft were the first to introduce a single engine to power both the main rotor and the tail rotor on the tail of the aircraft. Um, that would control directional flight. The VS-316 was designated the R-4 by the U.S. Army Air Force and was the first, world's first large-scale mass-produced helicopter and the first helicopter that was flown by the U.S. Army Air Force. Um, it was used by the U.S. Army Air Force, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Coast Guard, and the United Kingdom's Royal Air Force. So this was really the first military helicopter that, we, that you can see. The R4 has a heavy gauge tubular steel frame and most of the surfaces are covered with fabric, including the main rotor blades. Innovative features include the totally enclosed side-by-side -side seating for the two-man crew, so you can see here, um, dual controls and the Warner Aircraft Corporation R550 Super Scarab 185 radial engine, generating 200 horsepower and enabling a cruise speed of 65 miles per hour and a service ceiling of 8,000 feet. This is actually Igor Sikorsky sitting in his, in his R4, just one of the many famous things that Igor completed. So in 1943, an R-4 landed on the deck of the tanker Bunker Hill, which was the first landing by a helicopter on a ship at sea. In April 1944, the helicopter conducted the first combat rescue in the um, China-Burma-India theater. 100 R-4Bs were produced for the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Navy, and the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy. Less than a dozen remain, um, and they're either in storage or on static display. So this is our R4, which is um, above our Sikorsky exhibit, which is getting redone. Sikorsky actually, the company Sikorsky turned 100 this year, which is pretty cool. So we will be redoing our Sikorsky exhibit, um, which we're very excited about, with obviously our R4 on display still. All right, back to our fighters. We got to mention the Corsair. So this was built by the Vought Aircraft Division of the United Aircraft as a carrier-based ground support aircraft for the Navy and Marines. The first prototype Corsair flew in 1940. In an early trial, it flew speed courses from Stratford to Hartford at 405 miles per hour. 
the Corsair combined the most powerful engine of the period with the smallest possible airframe. It was extremely successful. The aircraft went into continual production from 1942 to 1952. It was produced by Vought Aircraft with Hamilton propellers and Pratt & Whitney engines. Um, our aircraft at the museum and on the Corsairs are actually fully Connecticut built. So this is actually Connecticut's state aircraft. Um, Corsairs saw service in the war with Japan and through Korea and also served in rescue and foreign air forces into the 1970s. The unique gull wing design helped strengthen the landing gear and provided clearance for the 13 foot four bladed propeller. So you can see it a little better in this picture. This is our Corsair at the museum. We actually have ours in a folded wing. Um, we have our wings folded, so you can see that's what it would have looked like in flight. However, since it was a carrier landing aircraft, a lot of carrier based um, aircraft have those foldable wings there so that they can fit better on a ship. So early members of the Connecticut Aeronautical Historical Association were really eager to own their own Corsair. Like this is the epitome of Connecticut airplanes right here. Um, and in 1961, the US Navy gifted the organization with a Vought XF4U4 Corsair. Um, so with, after some financial struggles, we were able to bring the Corsair up to Connecticut where it underwent restoration in the 70s. Um, the museum's Corsair is unique not only because there's only a few Corsairs left, um, because it's actually a pre-production prototype. So it's very, very early in the Corsairs. It's actually the third of this designation of Corsairs ever built, which is why you see the X in front of it, pre-production prototype. All right, and finally, we would be remiss if we did not mention the a Boeing B-29 Super Fortress. So the B-29 was a four-engine propeller-driven heavy bomber um, designed by Boeing for long-distance and high-altitude operation for use by the U.S. Army Air Force during World War II. It was first flown on September 1942 and was the most advanced bomber of it, the era. Features included a pressurized cabin, an electronic fire control system, and remote controlled machine gun turrets, basically like a computer system for the aircraft of its day. A total of 3,970 planes were built by Boeing in Wichita, Kansas, and Renton, Washington, um, and by Bell Aircraft in Georgia, and the Glenn L. Martin Company in Nebraska, with production ending in 1946. The Super Fortress was primarily used in the Pacific Theater, culminating in the use of dropping the world's first atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August 1945, which led to the surrender of Japan and the end of World War II. The planes and crews were again called into service in Korea between 1950 and 1953 and battled the new foes of jet fighters and electronic weapons. The final B-29 left service in September 1960 and currently, there are only two flying B-29s left today, Doc and Fifi. Sometimes Fifi comes over to Barnes and Westfield, so you might have seen Fifi flying out of there. In 1973, the good old Bradley Air Museum acquired a B-29 from Aberdeen Proving Ground um, in Maryland. So groups of volunteers traveled to Aberdeen to collect the aircraft. So you can see here, these are some of our volunteers in the 70s. Um, coming to get these parts. They took the aircraft back to Connecticut um, to be reassembled. And it was actually, our aircraft is two separate B-29s kind of compiled together. We were able, we had to get a different fuselage or main part of the aircraft. Ours was damaged um, when we were arrived. Like I said, it uh, was damaged in our tornado. So it sat waiting restoration for many, many years. Oops, I keep pointing at the wrong thing. Here it is on display, looking a little different than when it arrived from Aberdeen. So in 1993, um, Lieutenant Donald Lundberg of the 58th Bomb Wing visited the museum and he said, we got to do something about this airplane it's sitting in your yard. Let's restore this up. Um, and so he really pushed to have it restored in honor of the 58th Bomb Wing. In 1998, restoration on the plan, plane began in earnest um, to meet the deadline of the dedication of May 31st, 2003. The plane was restored outside until it eventually moved into our restoration hangar. Um, the 
B-29 hangar was built specifically for this plane um, and the 58th bomb wing. So the hangar um, was built and nearly 100 volunteers worked on the B-29, which is interpreted to be Jack's hack of the 58th bomb wing. Um, after the dedication, restoration work continued until 2010. Um, and this airplane is on display in the museum. We do let visitors come into the bomb bay of the aircraft so you can see what it was like. 58th bomb wing flew what we call over the, over the hump. So they would fly um, refueling and restocking missions over the Himalayas, which was actually considered so dangerous that those crews received credit for a bombing mission even if they weren't bombing because flying over the Himalayas was considered just as dangerous as going out on a bombing mission. Um, you'd have 11 people on this aircraft. You'd have several in the front cabin. You'd also have a second gunning area in the back. And the poor, poor kid who was in the tail gunner position at the very end of the airplane was the most dangerous spot in this whole aircraft because what are you gonna shoot out on an airplane? you're gonna shoot out the controls at the back and that poor kid was stuck in the back. Um, they, they were kids flying these um, at the time. We do have, I wish I didn't put a picture of this because it's a little hard to take a picture, but from this front end here to the middle compartment, there is a tunnel which you would have to crawl through. It's very small. I, I look at it and I get claustrophobic just thinking of it, but that is how you got from one end of the plane to the other. Like I mentioned, lot, this was really considered, oops, closed out of the thing. Um, this was really considered quite extensive for its day. Um, just the fact that it did have pressurized cabins and remote control um, gunner stations really allowed for, uh, considered high tech um, for this aircraft. That, like I said, that is only a fraction of our aircraft, but also a fraction of our um, warbirds on display. But those are some of my personal favorites and uh, personal favorites at the museum here. Um, that is what I have for today. Thank you so much. Are there any questions that I might be able to answer? Yeah. Well, my favorite airplanes are the uh, P-51 and the Spitfire. Do you have any of those? Great question. We do not have a Spitfire. Um, one of We run a summer camp, and one of my camp kids was very devastated to hear that. Um, but we do have a P-51. However, it's a little funky. So our P-51 is not restored to its World War II era uh, glory. It was after the war. Um, a lot of P-51s were taken and used as racing aircraft. And so our P-51 was one such aircraft. It was owned by a man named Anson Johnson. He took it, um, refitted it, so its wings are a little shorter, its scooped belly is a little cut, um, put a bigger engine, and he raced it, and he um, won the Thompson Trophy in it. So when he donated it to the museum, we restored it to his um, racing look rather than the, what it would have been in World War II. So yes, we have a P-51, it is bright yellow, so it does not look like a P my grandfather flew P-51s. I said if he ever went, he'd be like, that's not what I flew. Um, but it, it, is, it, is, uh, it is at the museum, yes. Any other questions? P-47? Yes, we do have a P-47. Yes. You still have the antique cars there? Yes, we do have some antique cars and um, little motorcycles as well from Springfield. How many hours in the museum? Great question. We are open from 9 to 4 every day um, right now. During, as uh, blah, blah, blah. Labor Day hits, we are closed on Mondays during the winter. Um, but we are open 9 to 4 every day, so feel free to come on. Seven days a week, yes. Once it hits Labor Day, six days a week, we're open Tuesday through Sunday um, during the off season um, when it's not summer. But yeah, any other questions I can answer for anyone? I, before I let you go, I do have some handouts. So I'm gonna start, if you wanna just take one and pass that down that way. If you guys wanna take one and pass that that way. Um, so what I'm handing out, just a little rack card about the museum and has some cool pictures on it as well. And then coming around on the other side is just some of those facts about those aircraft we talked about today. Um, just because sometimes it's nice to have a reference for what you talked about. And then I'm just gonna come around. This is might be a little silly, but we think it's fun. These are some pencils color changing at the museum. <laughs> Here you go. 
We love, we love free goodies here at the museum. Feel free to swap colors if you don't like what you got. Pass these out. There you go. You don't have a V-17. We do not. We did during the tornado, and it was destroyed, but we no longer have a B-17. Not that I know of. I don't think so. No, just the B-29. You have one. Okay, perfect. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think so. Yeah, they were, they were much better than than previous. Yeah, it was it was a step in the right direction to you know what we have today. Awesome. Well, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, there might be some extras coming around. And then, did you guys get? Yes. How is the Air Museum primarily funded? Great question. So we are primarily funded a few different ways. We are. We are a nonprofit, so we get a lot from our admissions revenue. We also are grant funded, um, as well as individual donations, corporations, things like that. But we are a privately owned, but nonprofit museum. Was there um, more of those papers? Oh, wanted to take one pass. Awesome, thank you. I just want to make sure everyone got one. All right. Any other questions? No. Thank you so much for having me here. It was great talking with you all. You all have wonderful questions. Um, if you ever come to the museum, feel free to stop and say hi. Again, my name is Tiana, and we would love to have you come visit us sometime. So thank you all for coming out today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.